Thank you so much for your invitation. It's really after such a long time of pandemic where we've attended many, many conferences, but most of them have been online. The fact that we now have this first face-to-face uh, -face conference in such a big uh, room with so many people out there is very impressive. I've spent many years researching into how the digital revolution and digital technologies affect the world of employment. In recent years, with the arrival of the COVID crisis, just like many other people, I had this feeling in the department where I worked that it was really important to adapt and try to understand via, of course, our analysis, how the pandemic, which had such a major impact, especially initially, to see how it was affecting the things that we normally study in our department, which is the world of labor. And now I'm going to try to reflect together with you and see how this affects the skills needs and the type of issues that are more interesting in this kind of a conference, conference on vocational education training. So how has COVID or the COVID crisis affect skills needs? Well, here we should make a clear differentiation between the short, the medium and the long term in the sense that, as I said earlier, the COVID crisis came from outside. It was totally unexpected. And what it did have was this incredible impact, especially initially, initially on our social lives. We all know that, but it also had a major impact on work, on our work. And the impact that it had on work was very, very different depending upon the level or the skills level of uh, the workforce. The first differentiation was the ability which different kinds of jobs have and the type of tasks, the type of skills that are required for that job, the ability for those kinds of jobs to be able to be carried out remotely. This was the first thing that really had a, a differential impact on jobs in the crisis. All those jobs that could be carried out remotely, and here we're talking about all those jobs that don't require a direct physical interaction with people or with things, and that includes all kinds of jobs such as office work, especially modern office work, and even education, because although it does require interaction with people, it's not a physical direct interaction. So that meant that with video conferencing, etc., this kind of work could be carried on online. So all of those jobs and by the way, the first time that we were talking uh, about the crisis, we tried to quantify how many people were being affected. And we realized that around a third of uh, jobs could be carried out online without any major problems, technically speaking. Initially, during the first lockdowns, everything that everybody that could work from home started working from home. So a time came in which around a quarter and a third of workers were actually working from home. What does that mean? It means that those works that carried out these kind, those uh, workers that carried out these kind of uh, uh, jobs online saw that there wasn't so much of an interruption in their job. They could keep their jobs and keep their income. But not only that, they could do that more safely. And then we've got the other two thirds of workers that dedicate themselves to some kind of physical work, either with the jobs or need to physically have in contact with people. And their impact was far stronger. And there we differentiate between three categories. We've got the famous essential workers, all those jobs that are necessary to keep society up and running and alive and of course that includes includes basic social services health services everything related to um, the sale of food uh, supermarkets etc but they were in a risky situation and those were the people that had to really face up to sanitary or health risks so those jobs that couldn't be done remotely and that weren't essential can be divided into two groups, which are those non-essential works that don't have 
don't incur some kind of a specific uh, risk to health because they're not interacting with people, but with things such as works, jobs in industrial areas. But they did have an economic impact because in many of these jobs, the fact that activity closed down, that actually affected uh, many people's uh, economic situation with furloughs, etc. And then you've got other kinds of works, manual kinds of jobs that can't be carried out online and that do require a great deal of social interaction. We're talking here about hotel and catering work, and that's where there was a greatest impact because they saw that they were affected economically because activity in these sectors came to a standstill. And, and, that, and of course, everything related to workplace safety, especially initially. And what those that actually managed to carry on working had a health risk in addition. So that just gives you a, a, a sort of a initial picture of the situation depending on a job type. Initially, it would seem that it, people thought it was the end of the world, even in employment uh, terms. But actually what's been seen is that as the pandemic has uh, progressed and uh, was solved in inverted uh, commas a lot more quickly than people would have expected in the sense that we could return to a certain amount of normality more quickly than was expected. That wasn't the same for the case of the employment. In fact, we now have got similar activity levels than as before uh, with, of course, some small changes for example, people still have to wear masks when they go to work. There has to be ventilation in the rooms. But these aren't key uh, changes that affect uh, skills levels. What we have seen in the long term is the effect of teleworking. As I said earlier, remote working became far more common than it had been uh, previously. Before the pandemic, only 3 to 4 percent of workers in Spain Rem worked remotely, but with the arrival of the pandemic, especially the critical um, initial times, that amount increased to 25 to 30 percent. It was initially thought that this was a change in which we w wouldn't return to the previous situation, that remote working was here to stay. Some th a part of that is true, but actually the data that we're seeing for remote working post-pandemic, and by the way, we need to remember that the pandemic hasn't disappeared yet. There's still a bit of time to go before we reach complete normality, but remote working in Spain and many Euro other European uh, countries has remained at 10, 11 percent. It's not such a low level as it was pre-pandemic, but it's never reached the potential that we had imagined that it would do. So quite probably uh, remote working will become something more uh, common, but you haven't seen the uh, key changes. Once again, if we think about skills, remote working actually doesn't actually change the kind of uh, skills needs that existed previously. Perhaps the longest impact of the pandemic on the labor market and on our lives in general is simply that there's been a sort of a stepping up and deepening of um, a process that wasn't by no means uh, uh, new, which is rather the digitalization of increasing areas of life and especially economic life. So it's become quicker and deeper. And when I say deeper, what I mean is that what the pandemic does, it sort of breaks through some cultural or perception barriers or obstacles People were concerned about uh, privacy issues with the uh, in relation to remote working. But once the pandemic uh, arrived, using these digital tools, many of these barriers, many of the breaks that existed on uh, the use of digital tools were broken through. So 
What the pandemic does is it steps up and deepens a process that already existed. So if we think of the long-term implications, not so much as the short-term ones of the COVID crisis, probably that's what we really need to talk about, a, a deepening of the digitization of work. And this profound, this deepening, and this is something fairly new, is that in COVID times, especially in those uh, job types and those economic sectors when people started uh, remote working, all sorts of platforms uh, suddenly popped out to coordinate and manage these remote work process in a far more efficient way. What these platforms tried to do was to repeat or reproduce those coordination mechanisms that you get naturally in any kind of office because we interact normally in an office with other people. So what these platforms do, and so many of you use Slack, Teams, and other kinds of platforms of this kind that companies have started using in their work process. These platforms were used to coordinate those people that are working from home to create interaction spaces, control the uh, input of labor of different workers inside a complex uh, process. So when that happens, then when people go back to the office, these tools are kept on. Many of these management tools, these uh, labor management tools that were used during the pandemic for remote working are actually now being kept on after the return to a certain amount of normality. And this is a change. We've studied that for a time now, and it's what is sometimes known as the platformization of working processes. And that means that increasingly, coordination mechanisms for complex labor processes rather than being managed by a boss who uh, coordinates his or her team what is done is uh, done through a digital tool so that automatically or semi-automatically or algorithmically manages all of these processes this is a major change but i'd say it's rather a change to the nature and content of work than skills needs because we're not talking about uh, unknown tools these aren't tools that require per se any kind of a specific skills or qualifications but it just it turns out that a generalized use of these tools change the interrelations that we have at work and the nature of our work. And in fact, what they change more is the type of skills or tape needed those that actually use these platforms that manage. It's the bosses that have their uh, work change because normally they are the people that set down the rules and regulations. And these kind of tools actually uh, change or replace these management roles that many bosses had. So one of the most important impacts, people talk a lot, and I'll just mention this quite briefly. People talk about the impact of the pandemic on automation or robotization of labor. It would seem that the ideal solution to many pandemic problems would be to robot or automate many of the jobs that humans do, because robots don't fall ill and don't contaminate each other. So I remember reading about that during the pandemic, and this is something that I have to say that we haven't found any significant evidence that that has actually happened on a relevant scale. But looking into these things, you always get the feeling that the idea of large scale automation or robotization of labor over recent years is pretty much exaggerated. If you look down at the details and the data that exist about robot use in 
production and economic processes. They do exist, but they exist, these robots, in certain specific industrial sectors that have always been heavily automated for decades and centuries now, even since the Industrial Revolution. And that's where certain robotic technologies are introduced, which can replace jobs, but on a very, very small scale. And their impact on a large scale isn't actually what you see reflected in the media. So, in this sense, I'd say the pandemic actually hasn't changed very much at all. The situation is very similar to what it was today. So, what is the impact of the uh, pandemic on skills demands? What sort of changes are there? Well, I'd say there's not been a great deal except for uh, deepening of digitization. Maybe we could therefore think about this, and I'm sure you've probably debated this, which is to what extent digitization affects skills needs. It does affect them, but in general, what I tend to think and what I tend to say, and this isn't my specific area, the feeling that I have is that if you look at those technologies that are being used in companies, even the most advanced one, machine learning, inter artificial intelligence, the most advanced and most modern technology would, would seem to have greater disruptive potential. You actually realize that all of these technologies are very good at doing very specific tasks, but something that is still a tremendous barrier for all these kinds of technology, especially for the most advanced in artificial intelligence, are for those more general tasks, which are mainly the human tasks. What I'm talking about are the basic cognitive skills, communication, flexibility, the ability to solve problems that you come up against for the first time in your lives, the ability to change plans. If the, if the problem parameters changes, how do you reignore things? All of these basic cognitive skills, and I'm not talking here about qualifications, I'm talking about skill skills that can be trained and that can be improved upon. All of these skills are skills which even today, the most advanced digital skills are not able, even remotely, to carry out effectively and economically feasibly. So. This is still the true value of human labor. And that's why I think that always, especially in a context of increasing digitization of employment in which these kinds of tools are being used, the importance isn't so much. And here I think there's a sort of a mistake with the debate. We seem to be obsessed with trying to pinpoint what are these specific tasks that are going to be necessary in the future and prepare people for that. I think that's a mistake because it's not so much the specific tasks that humans do better and it's better to plan for the future, but actually completely the opposite. It's the more general task. It's these general skills that are far more important and are going to carry on being more important in the future, especially in a future in where there are more digital tools. And to emphasize these basic cognitive skills is this idea of uncertainty. However much we try to predict the future, the future is uncertain. That's why it's in the future. So the greater the period of uncertainty you're in is, then it's very, very difficult to, s to find out what it is that labor, the labor market is, and the economy is going to need in the future for the world of worlds. If you don't know what's going to happen in the future, then the best strategy is to try to emphasize once again what you do know and that can be used in any kind of situation. And here I'm referring to basic cognitive skills where we know that whatever the future may hold for us, these skills will probably still be useful. In fact, despite the fact that there's a, uh, a certain obsession uh, regarding the replacement of labor, actually what new tools don't do is replace labor. They increase human labor. So in this context of technical change, these basic general skills will actually be increased by new technologies and they'll be perform far more valuable even so I just wanted to close with that comment because it's more related to digitization. May well be that the impact of the COVID, what will have, it'll, uh, it'll deepen and emphasize digitization more than anything else. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much.